Almost everybody. Okay. <clears throat> so before we get started, um, I like to start off every day by just asking people if they have any questions from the previous day's content. Um, so yesterday I asked you guys to watch the second video and summarize um, the, f I think I said five, I misspoke, uh, the, the four um, sort of important ecological services that are provided by nature. Why is this not showing up? There we go. Five ecological services, or the four rather, I did it again, provided by the natural world. Um, and those are support services, provisioning services, moderating services, and cultural services. So uh, the cultural services, I suppose you could take as a, a bonus. Those are um, things that the natural world provides that I guess are not really essential, but um, they, the natural world is nice. And I think that if you removed it, probably people would be um, less well, probably mentally. Um, one of the one of the nice things about where I live, at least, I, I, my place backs onto a forest, uh, and so yeah, especially over the last year, it's been nice to be able to occasionally go for a walk back there uh, when we're stuck at home. And that's you know lifted my spirits a little bit. Uh, I know not everybody has access to that, which is can be quite difficult. But um, anyway. I guess those are not essential. You can live without that. You could live in a bunker in your basement. <laughs> you don't. You don't necessarily have to ever go outside and enjoy nature. But but the other ones are are actually providing essential um, components to human life. Um, the moderating services are um, protecting us physically, uh, our health, um, by preventing extreme flooding events, uh, regulating the climate. Um, I can't remember if we get into this in the plants unit too much, but um, trees actually do a huge amount to regulate the climate, uh, not only just by absorbing carbon dioxide, which is, I mean, they absorb greenhouse gases, which is part of it, but um, they also release a great deal of water into the atmosphere, which uh, naturally cycles um, and increases precipitation. Um, so there's a there's this weird effect that if you cut down enough trees in a forest, uh, the Amazon rainforest, by the way, is getting uh, awfully close to this uh, threshold. But if you cut down enough trees, all of a sudden there aren't enough trees left over to put enough moisture back into the atmosphere to maintain the remaining trees. So then you get sort of this uh, uh, compounding effect, um, a positive feedback loop, it's called. Um, anyway. Uh, so that, those are moderating services. They're, they regulate our environment. The provisioning services um, are, well, they're just, we use products of nature, um, uh, food, lumber, fuel, etc. All of those things are essentially, um, well, they're essential. They, we, we can't live without a number of them, um, at least not with our current systems. And then the last component here, the support services. Um, this this is probably the most essential for humans in that they, you know, provide us with things like oxygen and uh, um, nutrient cycling, uh, like nitrogen cycling through the natural world. Um, they form soil, which we use for farming. Uh, the natural world is our water purification system. We we do some additional water purification, but but the initial water purification is all done naturally, um, and without that, we we wouldn't have drinkable water. So. Um, yeah, th these are pretty important. Um, so anyway, as I mentioned yesterday, even if you don't care, uh, you know, you're not a big fan of bunnies or whatever, animals, plants, you name it, um, they're still doing something that's essential for you to remain alive. So anyway, I'm going to move on here. Um, any other, were, there, were there any questions from yesterday's content, from the analysis questions, from the questions from the article? Hopefully the article didn't get you too down. It's a little bit depressing sometimes to see the amount of biodiversity that's being lost on earth although it is within our control that's correct yep yep kim um you're going to hand those in before midterm and before the final and i that's exactly what i'm looking at them for i'm looking for how you've completed it so are you using full sentences are you when we do get to the problem solving section are you writing out the full problem solving when you're problem solving the questions. I mean, th that's that's the practice that you, you need in order to answer the questions effectively. Um, 
Uh, and, and I am looking at it for learning skills, that's right. So they're, they're not being assigned a numerical grade. It's not part of your mark, per se. But keep in mind that um, when you're working at home, and uh, even when we're doing hybrid learning, I, I can't really watch you work. Uh, so I, I, it's very difficult for me to assess what you're doing when I, you know, I, as soon as I, even right now, but as soon as I turn this, you know, uh, stream off, you you could be doing nothing. I, I don't know what you're doing. So you say, I, I need some way to assess the the, the learning skills component. I'm, I'm required to assess them. So so anyway, that that's the tool that I'm going to use. I'm sure other teachers are doing other things, but um, I, do, I do need something to work from. Okay, so what, what we're going to talk about today, it doesn't look like there's any additional questions from the homework. So what we're going to talk about today um, is the idea of classification. There's a lot of living things. We mentioned in general yesterday. Um, but I, I didn't I didn't pull out specific numbers. So we're going to talk about that today. This idea of, yeah, there's a lot of living things. We have to have some way to organize them. If you want to track as an ecologist or as a biologist in general, um, what the status is of Earth's biodiversity or biodiversity in a particular ecosystem, you, you have to be able to measure what the diversity is. Uh, and for that, you need to know how many species are there, how many things are living here. Um, and you, sure, you can give them a name. You can call this a whatever, spotted owl and this whatever. Um, but that alone, simply naming everything, is not a great way to keep track of everything. Uh, because it's, it, it's very useful for biologists to, to categorize things, groups based on similarities. For example, um, we, we would have talked about this in grade nine, we, we group things by uh, the idea of what they eat. Um, so you would have uh, grouped things as a herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, etc. I mean, you probably talked about that in grade seven and eight too. So uh, that, that's one way in which you can classify things by, by, their, uh, by their food. Um, what we do more generally in classification um, is we categorize things by their morphological characteristics. That's the most common way. And more recently, uh, we classify them by their genetic characteristics, so by what's actually in their DNA. So um, that system of classifying things, it is a system that was developed um, in the 1700s, Carl Linnaeus. We'll, we'll, well, I'm going to get to that in a second. but. Um, we still use that system more or less with some s significant modifications. So that science of making a classification system, is, it is its own science, is called taxonomy. Uh, and then, as I mentioned here, there's a lot of species. So how many are there? Uh, we don't have an exact number. Around 9 million, um, give or take. They, this, we, we obviously haven't discovered them all yet. So part of this is an estimate, and it's, it's based on every time we look, how many new species we find. So um, essentially, it's diminishing. So the more we look, um, we, we, we always find new ones. There's always new ones to find. Um, I feel like, did I write down how many we've actually classified here so far? I think we've classified three or four million at this point. But there's, qu there's quite an amount that we haven't discovered yet, or at least haven't named. Um, anyway, it, we're seeing fewer and fewer every time we look. Uh, and then so you can make a prediction based on how often you look and how, how many less you're seeing each time you look. And then you can get a general sense for how many are remaining to be identified based on that. And so that, that's what that number is based on. It's, ba is that, it's based on a very large data set. But um, around 9 million. So yeah, that's a lot of things to classify. Uh, and so this system of taxonomy developed in the 1700s by Carl Linnaeus um, is a system for grouping things based on mostly on their morphology. And we talked about this idea of morphology yesterday, the morphological species concept. Morphology is the physical characteristics of an organism, what, like what they look like and what their structures they have, and their behavior. So typically, 
um, the taxonomy that's based on morphology is mostly based on physical characteristics. Uh, however, once, especially when you get down to the genus level or the species level, when we're right at the very bottom of the, like the, the finest degree of classification, uh, then we occasionally use things like behavior. So there may be two species that are morphologically very similar, but they have different mating behavior or they have different um, uh, times of year where they are fertile or whatever. Something like that. Is that is something that you would consider to be behavioral. Um, and bec because of that, you would categorize um, them as different species because they aren't going to interbreed. Um, but they are their physical characteristics are relatively similar or, or maybe the same. So, um, so morphology is, does consist of both, though. So it is physical characteristics and behavior. So when we group them together based on their characteristics, we call that grouping uh, genera. I oh, probably shouldn't cover it up. Okay, or a genera are groupings, or a singular, a single grouping uh, is called a genus. Okay, uh, genus is also the finest level before species. Uh, it's the lowest level grouping is also called the genus of the species. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Uh, the moose genus, M-U-S, uh, is comprised of rodents that have a pointed snout, small rounded ears, a body length scaly tail, and a high breeding rate. Okay, so that's the genus for moose, moose genus. And um, so that's the categorization right before species. Uh, so of all the organisms that are moose, M-U-S, um, in that genus, there will be more than one species within that genus, but they all have those similar characteristics. So there are levels of these uh, called ranks. Okay, they're taxonomic ranks. And um, oh, I don't want to skip over this part here. So anyway, before I get to the ranks component here, um, when you are writing the scientific name, this uh, by the way, that 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 idea of the the two name scientific name, which I'm sure you've seen before, uh, Homo sapiens. Um, Canis familiaris, that's, that's the uh, dog, the domesticated dog, um, whatever. That, that two-name name, it's called binomial nomenclature. Binomial meaning bi meaning two. Binomial, two-name. Nomenclature means name, so two-name name. name. <laughs> um, is that, that's, that's how we give a species a specific name. When you do that... The first name in the binomial nomenclature, so going back to the mouse, um, moose is the genus. Okay, So that's the level right before the species. So the first part is the genus, moose. You always capitalize it. So when you see these written, the, gen the genus is always capitalized. It's the first word. Uh, and then the second word is the specific species name. So this particular species, this is the common house mouse, uh, their species name is Musculus. So Mus Musculus is the full scientific name. And when you're writing a scientific name, you also want to make sure that you italicize it. Okay, so if you're ever typing it, and this is going to come up in your assignment at the end of the quad, uh, you got to italicize scientific names. So you capitalize the first one, and then you'll notice you don't capitalize the second one. I should probably write these this down somewhere. Uh, where's, it, where's the spot I can tuck this in? Oh, I'm going to put it right up here in the corner. I'm going to write it real small. So scientific names are called binomial nomenclature. Italicize. Oh, I talk use. What are you doing here? I probably spelled that completely wrong. Yeah, this isn't a word you use a lot. It, itali. Is it C I S E? That looks wrong. <laughs> that does not look correct at all. 
<laughs> How do you spell italicize? Is it S S I S I S E? No, that, that can't be right. Like this? <laughs> ah, there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> You got to italicize it, okay? If you're if you're typing it, obviously, if you're writing it by hand, you don't you can't italicize your handwriting. But um, but if, if it's being typed, you italicize. Um, capitalize the first name. Ah, thank you, thanks, Dominic. <laughs> second name is called the species name or the species epithet sometimes it's called okay so some basic rules and so if what that looks like in the end if I was gonna write homo sapiens I would write I'm gonna use my italics here there we go homo sapiens would look like that uh, another way to write it um, is that the genus you can actually short form to a single letter. Uh, this is found commonly as well. It's usually done after you've written it once in a particular text. Whenever you refer back to the species name again after you've written it once, you can just short form it by saying H dot and then sapiens. You, you've probably seen this with things like E. coli, which is Escheria coli, but Escheria coli is written as E dot coli like this which is just a short form and again that's a species name that works exactly the same okay so that's that's in general how you're writing that two species name um, but that's only the bottom two levels of taxonomy so there, there's more than just two ranks uh, which this would be genus and species the bottom two ranks or bottom two levels of taxonomy um, we categorize things from the most inclusive so that is the most general category uh, and I guess you could go up to the, the very most general category, which would just be living things. So living things would be the most general category. All of them fit in there. Uh, and then you go down and you subdivide the living things. Sure. Sure, I can post this version of the note, no problem. I'll throw it in the folder. Uh, by the way, you can always pause the video and go back as well. Just, you know, but it's harder to do with live, but, um, but yeah, sure, I can post this, no problem. Um, what else my train of thought? Right, uh, you go from the most general, um, so including all of um, living things, and, and then you, you start splitting it up by morphology, particular trait. So uh, I mentioned here that the moose genus has a particular set of traits, round ears, etc., um, but obviously that's fairly specific. So w what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through the entire set of classifications for people. I'm going to start with the one on the right here. People's good because uh, this is one that you're very familiar with. Okay, and we're, we'll go through all of the different levels. We'll start at the very top. Actually, I wanted to keep that last part. We'll keep that. Okay, so if we look at all the living things, the first way that we subdivide living things is by what's called domain. Domain is the highest level of separation. And there are three domains. We're, we're actually going to get into what the domains are and stuff a little bit later, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But you, one of the domains is eukaryotes. Okay, it's also called eukarya. And this is something that may have come up when you were in grade 10 science. The other, the other side of this are the prokaryotes. Anybody remember what a eukaryote is? What makes something eukaryotic or is a eukaryote? I'll, I'll give people a second. Just, I'm just curious if people remember this because this this is kind this is in the grade ten curriculum kind of um, when you're talking about cells right right at the very beginning you would have only looked at eukaryotic cells in grade ten they have all the classic cell parts 
mitochondria, Golgi apparatus. Nope. Nothing, eh? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay if you don't remember it. Um, so eukarya is the, a grouping that has membrane-bound organelles. They have a cell mem uh, not a cell membrane. They all have cell membrane, but um, they've got um, membranes around their organelles, or they have basically visible organelles other than um, ribosomes. Uh, all, all organisms have ribosomes, but uh, ribosomes are don't have membranes around them. They're just made of proteins. Uh, or actually, they're made of RNA. Um, but eukarya have... Oh, I'm still italicized here. Okay, so that, that's the highest grouping. And not all cells have membrane-bound organelles. Bacteria don't. They're, they're prokaryotes. So uh, that is the biggest division. And virtually all of the life that you're familiar with, if you look around, uh, plants, animals, fungus, um, th those, I mean, those are the macro ones, the ones that you see. And I guess protists, to some extent, you can also see with the naked eye. Those are all eukarya. They all have... Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, etc. So that's the first, the highest um, rank that humans fit under. We are also eukaryotes. We have that. Uh, then we can subdivide us further into kingdoms. So kingdom is the next level down. Uh, and we're going to go through all of the kingdoms in this course and talk about the main um, traits that you would find in each kingdom. But you are probably aware that we're part of the animal kingdom. We are animals. And what makes something an animal? Well, there's a few traits. Uh, some of the key ones is that we're able to be to move on our own, so we're motile. That is not the only thing that makes something an animal because um, there are um, protists that can move on their own. So that that those aren't animals. So um, they also must be multicellular. So a multicellular organism that can move on its own is an animal. Okay, so that places us into our own category. That's another taxonomic rank, okay, which is our kingdom, animals, animalia. Uh, then of all the animals, we fit into a particular grouping, uh, a particular phylum of animals. This is the next rank called chordata. Okay, we are chordates. We are animals with a backbone. That's not actually what chordata means. Ah, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't make this table. This is actually taken out of your textbook, but this is, this is an error an error. Chordates actually uh, are animals with a spinal cord, not, not animals with a backbone. Uh, and th that seems like a, a minor difference, but there are animals with a spinal cord that don't have a backbone. So, so th that's, not, that's not a single grouping. So that's, uh, that's a mistake in the textbook. Um, so this, this should actually say um, animals with a spinal cord. I'm going to add that in. Oops. Okay, so of all the animals, we have spinal cords. Not all of them do, obviously. Insects don't, and the other phylums don't have them. Um, then of all of the chordates, we belong to a specific class of chordates called mammals. Uh, and those are chordates with fur and hair and milk glands. Of all of those mammals... We belong to a specific order of mammals called primates. Primates are animals, are mammals rather, with grasping fingers. So if you're a mammal and you can grasp things, you're a primate. So if you look at all the other things that you know are mammals, like cows and uh, what else has mammary glands? I mean, lots of things. Um, whales, uh, dogs, cats, whatever. Every, anything that feeds milk to their offspring. Um, none of those things have grasping fingers, grasping hands, uh, except for primates. So that, that encompasses actually quite a few organisms. Um, they don't all look like people, but they all do have sort of uh, grasping hands. Of all of the hand graspers, the primates, we belong to a specific family. 
and our family is the hominids. Uh, those are primates with a relatively flat face and three-dimensional vision. Um, so that includes a certain group. Uh, we are the only remaining species in our family of hominids. Uh, so all of the other hominids have gone extinct, essentially. And when we, when we, in the evolution unit, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what happened to the other hominids. Uh, how do we know they existed? And when were they alive? And when did they overlap with humans? And uh, we'll get to that stuff in, on a different day. But, but we are currently the only member of the hominid family. So the other ones have gone extinct. Uh, we don't have direct evidence of that, Trenton, of whether we or not we killed them off. Um, with, I, we're, like I said, we're going to spend a whole day on this. So I don't, I'm not going to dig into it too much, but um, with Neanderthals specifically, we may have outcompeted them. We may have simply merged with them in some spots um, because we, especially um, people of European background, have a fairly high percentage of DNA. Uh, that we share with Neanderthals. So the, the, we, we may have just joined them, or they may have just joined us. Uh, I think that's the more likely scenario. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll spend more time on that on a different day. Of the hominids, uh, we belong to a specific genus of hominid. Uh, our genus is called Homo, and those are hominids with an upright position and a large brain. Again, we are the only remaining Homos that are left, but there were others. Uh, and our specific epithet, that's our species name for our group, is sapiens. So that's the last component of this. And those are members of the genus Homo with a high forehead and thin skull bones. We are also, we are the species Homo sapiens. There is technically um, subspecies of uh, Homo sapiens. Ho we are Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, because there may have been other offshoots of Homo sapiens, which are also uh, extinct, by the way, um, that were very similar to us, um, but have gone extinct. And they were different enough genetically that um, we would probably morphologically classify them as other species. Um, but th those are all, they're all extinct. So, oh, there's only one remaining. And, and uh, I can't tell if this is italicized. I actually don't think that it is, which again, shame on you textbook for doing a poor job here, but uh, that, that should be italicized. Um, so that's our specific species name. So you'll notice that we have a whole system of taxonomy for humans, for Homo sapiens. Uh, it's not just our species name. So, but the species name is what you would call it scientifically to differentiate it. There's no other species that's going to have this, the same species name. Um, but it's important to know the entire taxonomy for each, and we, tr we keep track of the taxonomy for each. Um, when you choose your species uh, that you're going to do your project on, you are going to find out the entire taxonomy for your species, and I have some resources for you. There's actually um, places um, where we keep track of this, like um, repositories of information where we keep track of the taxonomy for various species. So I'm going to show you where some of those are on the internet, and you can find them. So a couple other examples. I'm going to go through these a little bit uh, a little bit faster here because I think you probably get the idea at this point. Oh, that's a. I just realized I that was a spelling error that I corrected. Sipa, not not kappa. Um. Yeah, you know when you really dig into the textbook and look at it really close, yeah, it's it's actually fascinating to see how many errors there are in it. There, there's actually quite a few. But um, anyway, um. Okay, so I mentioned here uh, this idea that domain is the top level. There are three domains, eubacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, this, this table actually only has things from domain eukarya. And then this is looking at four different things and comparing their taxonomy. So, for example, I'm going to look at human, dog, and fruit fly. I'll look at all of these guys together, and then I'm going to compare them to plants. So human, dog, and fruit fly, those things are all animals, okay? So starting off, their kingdom is the same. So if we look at the top here, the kingdom is the same between all of them. They're all animals. Now, they're not all chordates. So humans and dogs have a spinal cord, but 
Fruit flies do not. They're arthropods. Okay, so they're, they're part of a different phylum of animals. Of the chordates, both humans and dogs are mammals. Okay, they both have mammary glands, they have fur. Uh, and arthropods are specifically insects. Kim, when you, when you say human races, do you mean like our current concept of race? Or do, do you mean like when we, when we talk about, like if you see on like a, um, uh, on like a census form or something like that, where it asks you like about your race? Is, is that what you mean by human races? So race is an interesting concept. Um, it's not a biological concept. It's not a scientific concept because if you look at humans morphologically, they're they're basically indistinguishable. I mean, there are there are some very surface things that you could pick out in terms of variability among species, like skin color or something like that. But but if you actually investigate the biochemistry and morphology of humans. I mean, they're, they're identical. They're, they're, there's very, very low um, variability. And if you look at the genetic variability um, between groupings, between groupings that we call races, like that you would see on like a census form where people say like Caucasian or whatever on, on, a, on a census form, they, they're really not based on anything genetically. You, you wouldn't be able to even tell genetically there's there's more differences genetically within those groupings, so within what we would call a race, than there is between the races. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, once we get into genetics a little bit, things like skin color and stuff like that are... I mean, we're talking about like base pair differences here <laughs> between individuals. We're, we're not talking about like large-scale genetic differences. Um, so they're they're essentially indistinguishable. So, so the the idea of race is, is is a cultural and social invention. It, it's not it's not a biological invention. So that that's they they are extremely extremely small differences, especially on a genetic level. I mean, they they may look, visibly look like a lot, but um, oh, sorry, sorry, you're talking about something completely different. Uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan. Um, great question. Um. There is there's a great amount of debate on how the the idea of combination works between those uh, thing, and especially between Neanderthals and humans. Um, as I mentioned, there there is some genetic evidence to suggest that there is a certain percentage. It's like six percent of uh, Western European or Europeans in general, uh, their DNA is um, matched with specific Neanderthal genes. Um, that being said, not that there isn't a consensus scientifically about how that exactly occurred. We have a different number of chromosomes, um, and there's a, there, we were not really 100% sure of the mechanism of how those things could have been combined. Um, and the same thing is true for Neanderthals and Denisovans. That that um, we, the, I think the answer here is we don't have. I don't have a good answer for you <laughs> for how those things potentially combined. We we don't really know if that was possible or if that if that uh, that crossover in DNA can be explained through something else. Um, the okay over time. We're, like I said, we're going to spend an entire day on this, but. Um, some groupings came from other groupings. And you're right that migration does play a role in evolution. So there are hominid species uh, that migrated to different areas. And in their different areas, they speciated. They became separate species from the grouping that moved to a different area uh, migratorily. Um, so that, that did cause speciation. So there are splits that exist due to migration. Um but there are also examples of hominid species speciating within the same location 
and that that occurs through a mechanism called disruptive selection. I feel I feel like we're we're talking about an entire other day here. I, I I'm I'm going to how about I leave this question, Kim? It's, it's an excellent question, but we just spent a whole day on this, and I. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I could talk about this for an hour right now, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to preempt. I'm basically gonna cover everything that we cover on a different day. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put your question off. If you still have this question, if you're not sure about how they're departing from each other as species or potentially commingling later, uh, then let, let's chat more about that on the um, hominid evolution day, which is, I think, the second day of the evolution unit. Oh, I'm gonna come back. Okay, I'm not, I'm not putting off your question. I just, uh, just, just to a different day. Okay, anyway, you can you can follow all these down and they go into their specific groupings. And it's just important to note that as you go down, each of their specific levels of classification here are based on uh, morphology for the most part, okay? More recently, we've noticed that if you only base these divisions on physical characteristics, you actually end up misclassifying things. So you end up putting things close together that are actually very different from one another just because they have similar morphology. And that's due to something um, called convergent evolution. This idea that if your environment favors a particular type of, for example, body shape, uh, that you're going to see a lot of organisms take on that body shape and they're not necessarily related to each other. Uh, for example, if you look at killer whales and gray whales... Uh, or killer whales and beluga whales. Those two species look similar to each other. And, and, and simply by looking at their morphology, they're both mammals, uh, you, you would make the assumption that they have a common ancestor, a relatively recent common ancestor. Uh, but that is completely incorrect. So the killer whales are descended from a species very similar to the gray wolf, actually, uh, a larger sort of prehistoric uh, gray wolf type of animal um, whereas uh, beluga whales gray whales, they, they, they are they're descended from a completely separate mammal species a uh, land-based mammal species whales are interesting because they were land mammals uh, that became water mammals but they both departed from the land at different times from different subspecies um, so so we, we put them together in the same category because they, they look kind of similar and they have similar morpho morphology but it's actually really a mistake because they evolved at completely different times in geological history. They're, they're, they're not even closely related at all. Um, anyway, so if you go purely by um, morphology here, it doesn't work. So more recently, uh, we've, we've really spent a lot of time categorizing things by genetic evidence and looking at genetic difference. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later today. Uh, I think it's today. Hold on. Let me double check. I don't want to overshoot. I want to do tomorrow's stuff today. Going through taxonomy, through kingdoms and domains. And then I think tomorrow is phylogeny then. Oh no. Wait, is it? Hit it. Uh, prokaryotes. Yeah, so later today. Later today, we're going to chat about that. So uh, it's important to remember that this is a this system is flexible uh, and changeable over time. So we I don't want to call them mistakes, but we realize that certain things are more closely related to other things. Uh, we realize that some morphological characteristics are more important than other ones, and so this this system gets changed and updated uh, all the time. For example, uh, there used to be only two domains, Eukarya, and the other one was called Monera, but Monera is essentially prokaryotes, things that do not have membrane-bound organelles. Uh, and recently, when I say recent, I mean in like the last 20 years, but that's, that's fairly recent from a scientific perspective. Uh, I mean, it, it was being changed when I was in university, so I, I don't think I'm that old. Um, so not that long ago, we, we were making an alteration to this system, and we realized that the two prokaryotes, or prokaryotes as a group, have two very different subgroups in them, eubacteria and archaea, that split off from each other genetically, probably very, very early in evolution of life on Earth. Uh, it's probably one of the very first divisions of life, uh, the first speciation events. 
Um, so uh, they are, they're really completely different from each other, these two groupings based on their genetics. And so we created an additional domain. So now there's three domains, eukarya uh, or eubacteria, uh, archaea, and uh, eukarya. So um, this is a flexible system. That's, that's something that's important to keep in mind. We also add additional levels to this system all the time. And you're going to notice this when you look at your species. You'll see something like subphylum. <laughs> so subphylum is like below phylum, but above class. Or there'll be a super family, which is below, above family, but below order. Okay. Oh, biologists love to do this stuff. So they, they'll add in extra levels to, to adjust the classification system to make it more accurate. So that's just something to note. Somebody, uh, somebody asked me yesterday about the idea of subspecies that works similarly to this as well. So you, you've got a species, but there are groupings within it that are different morphologically enough difference that you wouldn't call them a separate species. They interbreed naturally, but they are still different enough. Maybe they're found in two regions of the world. Uh, so they're separated geographically or whatever. And then, then you end up calling them a subspecies. So, so there, there are other layers that you can put into this, but these are the standard ones, by the way, that you need to know. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. If you ever take another biology course, as long as you live in university, this comes up in every biology course you ever take pretty much, but you do need to know the levels of, of, of taxonomy, the, um, the taxa. Yes, that's true, Kim. We're, we're, we're going to talk about that more in the evolution unit as well. Um, so that's interesting. Um, I usually touch on that a little bit later when we talk about genetic evidence, um, but I, I can mention it right now. So, so Kim just mentioned here in the chat um, that we share about 44% of our DNA with bananas. So keep in mind that when we look at our groupings here, we are part of the same domain as bananas. And that is, we are both eukaryotes. And when you think about it at a cellular level, a lot of the DNA that you have is just devoted to cellular biology, basic biochemistry, how our cells put together. How does a uh, mitochondria work? Uh, you got to build the certain proteins for the mitochondria. You got to build it at certain times in certain places. You got to build your Golgi. You got to build the, uh, you got to build vacuoles. You got to build, you know, you name it. Think about all of the different cellular machinery that is conserved among all eukaryotes. That's a huge amount of your DNA. It's just how do you put a cell together properly to make it function? And yeah, we have a common ancestor with bananas. We do, if you go back far enough. Uh, animal and uh, animalia and plantae have a common ancestor um, that is a protist, probably, or a pseudo protist. It's like a pre protist. Um, but we do have a common ancestor with them. And, and, and because of that common ancestor, we share a great deal of DNA with them. Um, if you look at uh, a more recent uh, species offshoot uh, or a, a more recent speciation event, so if you look at, for example, us and chimps, so chimps and bonobos are our closest and uh, closest relatives uh, outside of, uh, so they're not in our genus or family, but they are in our order. Uh, we share about 99% of our DNA with chimps. Uh, because if you look at their systems biologically and ours, I mean, they're, they're essentially exactly the same. They're, they're, there's very, very little difference. Uh, now, obviously, the devil is in the details. The, uh, the important stuff is in the 1%, but, or at least the important stuff that we consider important that makes us human. But, but yeah, of course, we share a tremendous amount of DNA similarity with other primates. Uh, not with all primates, um, Chimps and bonobos specifically are very closely related to humans, but uh, but the further out you go, um, gorillas I think would be the next category over. over you know, you keep going over. Uh, it, it's progressively less, but but still, I, with all primates, we still share something like ninety six or ninety seven percent of our DNA, a very high percentage. Okay, question: When species consume a great deal of other species, do you mean consume as a food source? What do you mean by consume? Uh, 
It's too bad I can't just give somebody the microphone uh, in these instances. That'd be handy. Oh, <laughs> it's an interesting idea. Um, we, we're gonna we're gonna touch on this in the um, in, in the uh, animal uh, anatomy uh, animal physiology unit. When you when we you say you are what you eat, you, we um, we are if you break down the protein, fats, and carbohydrates of your food um, to their base molecules. For carbohydrates, it would be simple sugars. For proteins, it would be amino acids. And for fats, it would be uh, glycerol and fatty acids. Uh, those are common macromolecules that all living things are made out of. We all build, use those macromolecules to build our metabolism, to build our cells and DNA and whatnot. Uh, so on, at a very basic level, molecularly, uh, we are what we're eating. But the, the larger structures that I think that you're referring to, like DNA, which is what's actually made, we, we, we're not actually incorporating any of that that we're eating. We're, we're breaking it down to its base molecules and building copies of our own DNA with those molecules, but we're not actually taking in the DNA of the things that we're eating. Now that's true for humans. Uh, as a side note, bacteria or a lot of protists, uh, or sorry, not protists, uh, uh, prokaryotes rather, a lot of prokaryotes, bacteria mostly, can actually exchange DNA with their neighbors. So they're a little bit different in that they can just steal a piece of their neighbor's DNA or they can give a piece of DNA to their neighbors and laterally give genes to their friends, basically. It's like, oh, hey, I know how to make this cool protein that makes me uh, uh, more resistant to um, antibiotics. Would you like that DNA? <laughs> they can whoop, they can just create a little pillus and they can give that piece of DNA to their neighbor, which is kind of cool. Uh, this, humans are not capable of that, though. Our, our, uh, our cellular processes are far too complex to be just exchanging pieces of DNA with anything. But um, so we're not we're not converging in that way. Um, although that's it's a really interesting idea. Um, okay, do, do, do. okay. So I mentioned we have refined it significantly. All right, let's talk about this idea of dichotomous keys. So. There is a ton of diversity out there. How am I doing for time? 9.15, okay. Um, there's a ton of diversity out there. We need a system as scientists to figure out what's what. If I go out into the field, I'm a uh, mycologist, okay? I study fungus. And uh, you go out in the field and you are looking for a particular type of fungus and you wanna make sure that you are looking at the correct fungus. Um, and there's a lot of different fungus out there and many of them look sort of similar. You need a system, a methodical system, so that you make sure that you are always looking at the correct fungus and you haven't found a brand new fungus um, because you've got to be able to categorize these things. You've got to study them, where they live. Maybe you're doing, maybe you're experimenting, maybe you're doing an observational study and you need to make sure that you are, everybody in the scientific community is talking about the same fungus. When, when I say this fungus does this, then everyone says, oh yes, I know that fungus, that's this fungus. This is the same one we're talking about over here. And keep in mind that before this system existed uh, of taxonomy, uh, we didn't do this. <laughs> we didn't do it very well. So somebody in one country might be saying, oh, I'm looking at the, a blue spotted heron and then someone in another country would say oh well, me too i'm also looking at the blue spotted heron but they were looking at different things <laughs> they just thought that they were the same thing so um th that was extremely problematic in the early days of uh z um uh, of this of this study here of taxonomy and uh um of studying ecology so we're, we've gotten a lot better at this and one of the tools that we use uh, is a decision making tool called a dichotomous key a dichotomous key is basically a decision tree. You, you may have seen these before. It's like a choose your own adventure, basically. Well, that's that's a, a form of decision tree. Uh, and as you go through and make the decisions, does it have this, yes or no? Does it have this, yes or no? Does it have this, yes or no? Eventually you go down through the tree 
and you say, okay, what I have in front of me is a blank. So for example, let's say that I was looking at a whole bunch of invertebrates, okay? That is a subsection of eukaryotes and a subsection of animals, okay? We're in the animal kingdom. So in the invertebrate phyla, and I have something in front of me and it looks like this. Okay, this is a very general one, by the way, but let's say I've got something that looks like this. And I'm like, okay, what is this? So first of all, is it asymmetrical? That it is, it has no line of symmetry within it, or is it symmetrical? Okay, so I look at my organism here and I go, all right, well, there's a line of symmetry right down the center. So it's not this, okay? I go this way in the decision tree. Okay, that's my first decision. Then I look at the type of symmetry. Is it bilateral, which means that the symmetry is straight down the center? Or is the symmetry have a center point and that there are multiple sections that are symmetrical that come out from a center point? Okay, that's called radial symmetry. So, well, this is bilaterally symmetrical. Okay, so we're gonna go this way on the decision tree and it's not an Adarian. It's not a periphera, not an Adarian. Now I ask another question here. Um, does it have an anus? <laughs> Believe it or not, that is actually important uh, with regards to um, how you categorize it as a invertebrate. Um, and yes, it does. It has a full digestive tract that goes from the beginning to the end. So we're going to go this way in the, in the tree, and it's not a platyhelminth, which is a flatworm. Flatworms do not have an anus. They only have an in and no out. Uh, then their waste products just come out the mouth again. So uh, then we can subdivide it here again and say, okay, does it have visible segments or no visible segments? Well, I can see it has three visible segments. We're going to go this way in the decision tree. It's not a mollusk. Mollusks do not have visible segments. Okay, of these visible segmented organisms, does it have an exoskeleton or not? Well, yes, it does. It's a spider. So yes, it does. It has an exoskeleton. So it's not an annelid, which is a roundworm, uh, and it's an arthropod. Okay, so that, so that is a decision tree. Uh, and this form of decision tree, because it's asking questions about morphology, is called a dichotomous key. And you can do this for anything. You can build a dichotomous key of butterflies. You can buy, build a dichotomous key of mushrooms. You can, of North American mushrooms. You can build a dichotomous key of Ontario field flowers. You, whatever you want, and, and we very regularly do this as biologists. So this is actually an essential skill uh, that's in the curriculum that you need to know how to do for this course. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build some together. I'm gonna do a completely different one here. This, I built this last time with my other class. We're gonna build our own. I'm gonna get you guys to help me out. This was a little bit easier to do uh, in class. <laughs> because I was able to speak to students directly, but I'm gonna let you guys choose the characteristics. So keep in mind that when you're doing this as a biologist, what you are trying to do is base these on important morphological characteristics that are, um, and you're, you're attempting to break it down from an evolutionary perspective from the earliest evolved characteristics, that is the characteristics that the most things have, and then subdivide it to the least common characteristics. Um, and and uh, what you're basically doing there is you're separating the earliest evolved characteristics and, and all the way down to the most recently evolved characteristics. Now, when you guys are creating a dichotomous key, you don't have any of that data to go on, okay? You're, you're, just, you're just creating a key based on morphology. So it's not exactly the same. Uh, but the, the basic idea is the same. So when you're doing a key, there's a couple important things that you need to consider. Uh, one of them is that you have to base it in on morphology, actual physical characteristics. In our case here, I'm going to say that they have to be physical characteristics. Uh, I'm going to say that for your assignment as well. So you're, you're going to be creating a dichotomous key for your assignment. They, they have to be physical. Keep in mind that Morphology does include behavior, but I can't look at a picture of a butterfly and know what its behavior is, know what its mating patterns are or, or whatever, it's, its call or, or I don't know, butterflies don't have a call, but you know what I mean. 
Um, so normally you'd include behavior in this as well, but I just, it's not possible to do that for our types of keys. So we're, we're just going to ignore behavior for our purposes, but keep in mind that a real di dichotomous key may include behavior. So um, we're, 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 they have to be morphological. So physical characteristics in this case, uh, and they have to be objective. Objective means anyone looking at it is going to say, yep, that is what I see as well. <laughs> Basically, anyone looking at it would have to agree with you that that is a true difference between these two things. Now, this is where you can get into trouble because, for example, if you look at this uh, many times, and this is very common for students to say, okay, people would say long spikes on the wing, long spikes on the wing. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Okay, you look at this other one, you're like, okay, well, this one doesn't have long spikes on it. But there's one major problem here, and that is, what does long mean? And that's important because someone might look at this one and say, well, those are long. Those are long. This is long. So the long spikes is not a good characteristic to use. You need something specific. Spikes of greater than two centimeters. Spikes of greater than one millimeter. Uh, the spike extends further than the carapace or the spike is longer than the body length or something along those lines but something that's very specific um trend that's an interesting question uh, but it's a little bit off topic so i'm gonna have to d defer that one um So that's what I mean by objective. Just make sure that the things that you're choosing to subdivide your species are, um, everyone would agree. So some things that you want to avoid when you're coming up with um, traits that you're going to use for your subdivisions is don't use something like looks like a. Looks like a is totally subjective. Um, looks like a ball. Looks like a elephant. You know, you might think it looks like an elephant, but someone else might not think that it looks like an elephant at all. So, so don't looks like a something is a terrible thing to use as a morphological characteristic for this. So don't use that. Don't use big or small or long or short. You got to be very specific. Okay. Instead, if you're going to talk about shapes, you have to use something far more general, like circular has a circular head. I mean, that, that's people are going to agree. Either the head is circular or it's not. But head looks like a dollar bill or head looks like a dime. Like, that's, that's too subjective. But is circular? I mean, you could, you, could, you could make an objective statement about whether something was circular or not. Larger than two centimeters, smaller than two millimeters, tail longer than torso, whatever. Something along those lines. So I'm just saying try and keep it um, as... Uh, objective as possible. Okay, so now let's do this one together. So uh, the idea here basically is that we're going to create a dichotomous key with these butterflies. Uh, and then I'm, uh, after that, I'm going to give you guys some time and you are going to design your own dichotomous keys. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. I've been going really slow. The, the first dichotomy that you want to choose, it's helpful if you pick one that roughly splits the group in half. So if you could pick a characteristic, throw one out there, that subdivides these in half. In other words, one half has the characteristic and the other half does not. What's a, what's a characteristic from these butterflies that could split them in half? So I'm gonna start my key off here by saying all butterflies, or at least all butterflies from our sample. And then we're gonna have our first dichotomy, a decision that will split them in half. Okay, antenna. So I'm gonna visible antenna. Now this is, uh, Technically, these, these all have antenna, but, but the photocopier didn't, or the scanner when I scanned this didn't actually pick up the antenna on the other ones, which is perfect. That's fine. So, um, so there are ones that have antenna. That's, that's, a great, that's a great answer. Okay, so antenna, 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 and then these ones do not have antenna. Okay, so we've effectively split it into B, C, and F, and A, D, and E do not have it. Okay, so yes or no. So all butterflies. And then our, so our first question, our first dichotomy is, does it have antenna? It's a little bit smaller here. Does it have antennae? Yes or no? 
Okay, there's our first dichotomy. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a yes or no question. It could be something like, um, has three legs or has two legs or has four legs or has two legs or something like that. Um, so it, it could be just be a difference that subdivides it. It doesn't have to be a yes or no, but yes or no's are easy to do. So uh, does it have antennae? Yes or no, now we split them. You don't need to include um, what goes on the top and bottom, but I'm going to include them now just to make it easier for us to subdivide them. So B, C, and F have antennae. So I'm just gonna write them in here. You don't have to do this. So, but this is B, C, and F do. And then that means that the other ones do not, which is A, D, and E. So you, you don't need to include this information. That's, I'm just doing this as an aside to make it easier for us. So um, let's do the ones that do have antennae first. So let's just look at B, C, and F. Of B, C, and F, how could I subdivide these further? In other words, one of them has it or two of them has it and the other one doesn't. Or one has one and the other two have this other thing. What's, what's another characteristic, morphological characteristic I use to subdivide B, C, and F? Okay, circular patterns on the wing, perfect. So we, I would say these are circular here. Oops, these are circular here and these are circular here. I fully, I think that's objective, that's great. Um, so B, circular patterns on the wing. B, C, and F, right? Yeah. Okay, so we've got yes, no, and for yes, we've got B and F. And again, you don't need to include this information. I'm including it here uh, just to make it easier. Let's see. Okay, and then lastly, oh, so, so only C, by the way, goes no here. So you do need to indicate then at the end that this terminates in species C. Crescent shaped? I mean, if it's clear, um, I, I, I give, giving you a little bit of leeway here to decide if you if, if a trait is truly objective or not. Um, I mean, I could be extremely picky and that you, you have to eliminate a lot of things if I'm gonna be extremely picky here, but um, Crescent shaped is reasonable. I mean, there's a mathematical definition for what a crescent shape is. So if something does truly have a crescent shape on it, then I would say that you can include that. It's an objective trait. If it can be mathematically defined, you're you're pretty safe in calling it objective. Okay. Oh, that's for the... Perfect. That's for subdividing these two. Abdomen longer than wings. Awesome. So we got to do B and F. Here we have a clear abdomen is longer than the wings and then here we have abdomen is shorter than the wings perfect perfect that would that's so that'll subdivide b and f up here okay so we've got yes and no so abdomen longer than wings, yes, was B. So you do, you do have to indicate the species at the end when it terminates, so this is B. And then no F. Okay, so we've com completed our key on this end. Now we just need to add in our other species. So let's look at A, D, and E. We need to subdivide A, D, and E. How could I separate out A, D, and E? I wish I could see people typing. 
Okay, spikes extending from the wings. Spikes on the lower wings. So I would say fairly objectively here that we have spikes extending here and we do not have spikes extending here. I, I don't think that there's spikes extending here or spikes on the bottom set of wings. I think that that's, that's fair. That's an objective statement. So spikes extend from bottom wing. There, there, I'm pretty sure there's a name for the bottom wing in butterflies, but I don't know what the name is. So we'll just go bottom wing. Yes, they do extend. No, they don't extend. So yes, they extend is E and A. And again, you don't have to show this on your, but it's easier if you do. And then don't extend is D. Okay, and D, that, that one terminates with D. There's only one left. So we're gonna call that D. And then we've got the yes is here, E and A. All right, how do I subdivide E and A? One last subdivision. Top of the wings come to a V. Ah, I like it. Okay. Uh, the uh, anterior wing surface, this the front of the, it would be called the anterior, forms a V shape. Um, oh, that's, you know what? That's actually a little tougher because this also does form a V shape. How about, how about the, the anterior wings curve towards the rear? How about that? Where here, the anterior wings don't curve towards the rear. Here they actually curve down towards the rear. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm I'm taking the the rounded upper wing and I'm I'm just modifying it slightly. Um, so the anterior wing, I'm just I'm just going to modify that idea, idea just a touch. Curves. You could say towards the rear, or you could say posteriorly. Posteriorly is the the correct. Posteriorly, that is the correct anatomical term for that. Towards the rear is posteriorly, or to the posterior. Okay, so A curves towards the posterior. And what was the other one? E. E does not. Okay, so the key being here, I could go out into the butterfly conservatory and I catch a butterfly, shump, and I can go through my decision tree. Does it have antenna? Yes, it does. Does it have a circular pattern on the wing? Yes, it does. does is the abdomen longer than the wings? Yes, it is. So then I would go through and I would know that's B. So, um, no matter which species I start with from my grouping, I can follow my dichotomous key and it will always lead me to the same terminal end. So I can always identify this species as being the correct species. Okay, so it, it is a valuable tool, especially considering there's 9 million living things. Uh, you have to have good systems in place to tell them apart. So, uh, and this is this is one strategy that we use. So one, one thing to mention here, what would happen if all of a sudden this butterfly is found on the scene? which, I mean, this happens in biology all the time. We've got our dichotomous key for North American field butterflies, and this lands. I gotta go through, now I gotta go through my dichotomous key, so let's do it, so. Uh, does it have antenna? Yes, it does. Does it have a circular pattern on the wing? No, it does not, okay? So then I, I, I where I end up is here, I look at C, what I know my C looks like, which is this. And then I look at my new butterfly, which is this. Problem. 
<laughs> They're clearly not the same butterfly. What do I do? And we do this all the time in biology because we're always finding new stuff. Yeah, exactly. You got to create another dichotomy, right? So now we look at these two and we say, okay, well, what's different between the two ones that end at the same terminal? So, okay, perfect. Front and back wings are separate, visually separate. I like it. Yes and no. And so no would be the original C. And then we've got our new species, which is G. We added it in. Okay, and that's just what I wrote under here. You, you got to add a new dichotomy at the end point. Okay, antenna longer than the top of the wings, that also works. That's a good one too. Is everybody feeling okay with this? Like in general, what we're trying to do here? It's it's the same system. You're, you're just splitting it in half and splitting it in half or roughly half. It doesn't have to be exactly half, but splitting it, splitting it, splitting it with decisions until you get down to where there is a single member at the end of each terminal. Uh, and this is called a decision tree. I guess it looks kind of like a tree. It starts at a trunk and it branches off. Dichotomous key. Okay. So what I'm going to get you to do now is to practice this exact thing. So um, let me double check here. I think I might have modified what I'm getting you to do here. In fact, I'm actually going to bring it up on here. Okay, so first, uh, there is a short video for you to watch on taxonomy. Um, I think it's about eight minutes long. Uh, it goes over the history of taxonomical systems. I didn't go into any detail on that whatsoever. It talks a little bit more about Carl Linnaeus and how the system of taxonomy works. Life's filing system. Pretty good video, excellent summary of what we just discussed. Then. You're going to go in your textbook uh, to investigation 1.2.1 on page 32 and 33. Okay, you're going to do part A, part B, number six, and analysis A to C. You only have to do part A, part B, number six, and analysis A to C. So it's all of part A, part B, number six, only part six, number six, and then analysis A to C. So I'm going to open this up real quick because I there's always questions about exactly you're supposed to do on this page if you want to open it uh, up in your digital textbook as well we'll look at it together real quick here uh, I got to get a full PDF of this on my I uh, on my iPad so that we're able to look at it together because that would make this far easier but it's page 32 and 33 um, actually hold on I actually think I I did post it up here uh, 3233, here it is. Oh man, come on, don't make me sign into this. Is it gonna work? Why does it do that? Just on my iPad, it doesn't let me look at these. I don't know why. Okay, well, I'll find another way to bring it up in, uh, for next time, but Okay, Michaela, we're going to have to get that figured out for you. Are, when you're going, uh, Michaela, when you're trying to log in, did you save, um, 
So all of the practice questions that we do, Kim, like this are formative. The summative evaluation is when you're going to be designing one of these keys for me on your summative project that you're going to hand in. So yes, this is practice. Um, the practice quizzes are also formative. They are just for you to check your understanding. I, I'll, I'm going to get to those in a second. I, I'll, I'll discuss them. So try this. For people that are saying the textbook isn't working, go when you log in, every time you, you, you log in, you have to go to, I think it's, is it Nelson.com? Or is it my Nelson? My Nelson.com. But just my Nelson.com. Sometimes the address bar will automatically put in like the rest of an extension into there. You want to just go just to my Nelson.com. So if it puts in a, more of an extension on the URL, you just delete that part. You just want my Nelson.com. And then you have to log in with your username and password every time. Uh, a lot of people save a link, uh, like a shortcut to the textbook itself, but it doesn't work if you do that because it does because you you skipped over the login process and it won't let you skip in the, over the login every time you go back to it. So you have to start at mynelson.com, log into your account and then open the textbook. Are you guys already doing that? Okay, cool. So generally that works for most people. That tends to be the reason why it doesn't work on the login. If you are, are you, okay, awesome. If you are still having problems with the textbook, send me an email. There is another procedure you can do to clear your cache in your browser. If you already know how to do that, you can try clearing the cache and that almost always fixes all of the textbook login problems. So I recommend trying to clear your cache. If you're not sure how to do that, please email me and I will send you the instructions. No problem at all. Okay, so when you look at this on page 32, um, the first part here is, okay, I use figure one as a reference. It, it, there are a number of cartilaginous fish, okay? They're on the bottom of page 32. Uh, and it's asking you to just look at them. <laughs> look at the differences in the cartilaginous fish. There is already a dichotomous key created for page 32. So. For some reason, a lot of people make a key here. You don't have to make a key for the first part. So there is a key. The key is at the top of page 33. It is not a, visu a visual key. Uh, so we've been doing a diagrammatic visual key. Um, actually, how can I do this? I bet you, I, I, here, let me use my camera. Let me use my camera. There we go. I'll do it like this. So there is a this this is called a um, this is this is still a dichotomous key, but it's called a descriptive key or a oh, what's the other name for it? Um, Oh, the name is escaping me right now. doesn't matter. Anyway, it's the other type of dichotomous key um, where you simply write it out. It, it, this is very similar to a choose your own adventure. If you want, you can do your dichotomous keys like this. So it, it for number I there, the first choice, it's saying, is it a body with flat dorsal and ventral surfaces or is it a body with noticeably flattened surfaces? For the first choice, you go to option two. For the second choice, you go to option four. So you, you can do the key like this, facultative. It's a facultative key. You don't, uh, I personally find these more difficult to make. That, that, I mean, that's just me. Maybe you'd prefer to do it this way, um, but I, I find them easier to do as visual keys. So uh, when you're making your own keys, you can do the key this way, but I, I personally recommend doing them as a visual key. It's totally up to you. Uh, but this is just another form of key. It works exactly the same way. Okay, but this is sort of like a choose your own adventure style. 
you've ever read those books as a kid. I used to read them in elementary school all the time when I was a little kid. Anyway, um, so it already has a key. And what it's asking you to do over here is basically just go through and identify various things using the key. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. It's just asking you to use a dichotomous key to find certain things. Okay, pretty straightforward. The second part here, and this is the part where I'm asking you to do only number six. So number five, it says to create a creative binomial nomenclature name for each of these. I mean, you can do that if you want. You, you know how binomial nomenclature works, uh, where it's genus species, they do not have to be accurate at all. Um, so if you want to create a binomial nomenclature name, uh, you can practice using italics, capitalize the genus, don't capitalize the species epithet. Uh, you can do that. You can do that if you want, but you don't have to. Um, I mean, there's there's no time in which I'm going to ask you to name a new species. So I'm not really sure if that's like a vital skill you need to practice, but um, maybe just to practice writing what a species name looks like in terms of the formatting. Uh, but you can just call this figure eight, figure nine, or species eight, species nine. Honestly, like that's totally fine. But you are going to create a dichotomous key for these guys. Okay, so they are, um, uh, I believe they're all insects. They're, they are all arthropods anyway. Uh, and you're going to create a dichotomous key. So that's number six. And then you're going to answer some questions about your dichotomous key right here. Um, I believe, let me just make sure that I get the right thing here. A to C. So A to C is what you're going to answer from here. Just the first three. The other ones are asking questions that I don't really think you need to do. So don't worry about that. You only need to do A to C. Uh, and then you're going to do analysis questions on page 20. Going back a little bit here. It's these right here. And you're going to do number five and number seven. Okay, only number five and seven are necessary. It does require you to do a little bit of research. Okay, so it says research the following taxa for number seven. Yeah, you're going to need to use the internet to do that. Okay, so I'm going to give you some time to do that now. Um, you probably are not going to get all of this done by 1020. You might. You might, um, but if you don't, uh, this is this is the stuff that you would finish off during learning block three. You actually will probably likely have time during learning block two after you're done the learning block two stuff. Um, that's correct. This goes on the homework doc. So when, whenever you're given questions like this to complete, um, Whenever you're given questions like this to complete as part of like the day's tasks, unless it's on a worksheet that I give to you, and some of the lab activities and stuff will be on a worksheet, in which case you don't include that in your homework doc. But if it is just questions that are included on here, then you do include that. That, that goes in your homework doc. Yes, you did, Trenton. So uh, you're welcome, Trenton, to look over the video from yesterday's lesson. It is still posted under day one. So if you look, back here under day one, uh, there's a video at the top. Uh, it would be the video of our lesson from yesterday. The live stream is there. Um, but if you just go through uh, the questions below, it, it, it will explain to you step by step through day one what you need to complete. And th there's actually the homework questions from yesterday. It's analysis questions on page 13, number one, six, and eight. And if you haven't completed the uh, if you have not yet completed the student parent information survey, please do that. I definitely need to get that from everybody. Um, I'm trying to compile, especially parent contact information. So uh, if you could complete that as soon as possible, that would be awesome. If we're doing homework on paper, can we just put pictures? Yes, that's exactly what you do. So if you are doing homework on paper, which is totally fine, take a picture of the paper when you're done and you want to insert it into a Google Doc then that, that's your homework Google Doc. It's the same document, but it'll just have pictures in it instead of your text that you've been writing, and that's totally fine. Many students did that last quad. Um, the, so the key is, oh, that's good, Trenton, by the way. Um, the key is that I'm able to open your doc and look it over, and that it is one single document per unit. If it's more than one document per unit, every time I have to open a document using the, the marking software here, 
It takes a long time. It downloads it, it formats it. There's like a bunch of stuff. So if you're handing in 25 documents, like one per day or something, it, it's like, it's a ridiculous. It takes me like 15 minutes to mark, to mark. And which is just, I don't have time for that. So, um, so it, it does have to be one document. Can you just write your answers on the computer? Absolutely. I encourage you to write your answers in a Google doc. Uh, it's easier that way. Uh, but you don't have to. Some people prefer to use pen and paper, and you're welcome to do that as well, as long as you take a picture of it and insert it um, into your Google Doc, your homework Google Doc. That being said, um, for the genetics unit, there's some problem solving that you're going to do. You probably want to do that on paper. It's easier, in my opinion, to do it on paper. However, you don't have to. So if you want to find a way to do it on a Google Doc, you're welcome to do that. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to let you guys work on that right now. Sorry for talking so much. Um, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about phylogeny when we come back at 11.05. So I'm going to I'm going to disappear now. Uh, I, I'm here in the chat for the entire time if you have questions. What is the new assignment for the vocabulary list? So, Kim, you, you add to the vocabulary list at your leisure. So anytime we do a note together, reading from the text, homework, whenever you come across new vocabulary, you add it to your vocabulary list. So it, it's one of those, it's just like a constant thing that's in the background. It, you're meant to be adding to it as we go through the unit. So you, you decide when you add, or are you asking when it's due? The, the vocabularist runs for the entire unit. You hand it in at the end of each unit, and at the beginning of the next unit, you create a new vocabulary list for that unit. So there's one per unit. Okay, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna let you guys work. Uh, any questions, let me know, and uh, I will see you guys at 11.05.
We've got two topics we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about phylogeny. Um, so phylogeny is the incorporation of genetic information into old school taxonomy, which we talked about this morning. And then we're going to talk about just the kingdoms um, and the domains, which are above the kingdoms. Uh, just in basic, what's out there in terms of life. Then for the rest of this unit, what we're really going to do is we're going to in uh, we're going to have a much closer look at the kingdoms. Uh, by the end of the unit, you'll know what the major kingdoms of life are and the properties of the organisms in each kingdom. So, for example, if you were out and about and you saw something, you would be able to identify it and say, "Well, that's a fungus." I mean, you probably can do that to some extent already, but um, the edge cases, the things that are similar to uh, stuff in other groupings are a little bit harder to identify. Uh, same thing with protists, uh, how to identify the different types of single-celled organisms under the microscope and things like that. So um, that's where we're headed. So I'm gonna jump over to this note and of course it stopped working again. Why does it do that? There we go. Okay. So one thing that we've discovered through um, genotyping, which is uh, gathering evidence of the genetic codes of multiple organisms. So that, that, that's, rel that's relatively new. Um, we only genotyped or figured out the entire DNA sequence for humans uh, 12 years ago. Not a long time ago. So um, certainly within your lifetime, uh, is we, we were able to sequence the entire genome of humans. And since then, since we figured out how to do a, uh, a complete sequence of an organism, uh, and, and before humans, we had done a few other things, um, some uh, simpler organisms that have uh, shorter codes uh, and a number of microorganisms. but. But now, now that we've figured out good systems for uh, figuring out the entire code of a particular organism, we can fairly easily and fairly cheaply, more importantly, uh, sequence the entire genome of an organism. And so as part of zoology and taxonomy and, and very many areas of biology, actually, um, we collect samples of organisms and we genotype them. We, we sequence their entire DNA. And when you do that, you can find areas that are the same, the exact same DNA between organisms. So er areas that are the same, and when I say exactly the same, I don't mean letter for letter code exactly the same. I mean, the sections are the same length, they make the same proteins, there are still versions of those proteins that are a little bit different between individuals, but they do the same thing. Essentially, they are the same genes. For example, you might have a gene for eye color, and we have two of them actually, um, and, and one of them is says brown eyes and one of them says blue eyes. Uh, so those are not identical to each other, but they are largely the same. They are still an eye color gene. Uh, and so we, we say that those D, that DNA, those two pieces of DNA are homologs or homologous to each other. Okay, so this is an important concept, this idea of homologs. It's the same gene, but it may be not exactly the same, like word for word, but or character for character in the code, but it is a homolog. So they do they do the same thing. So we can look at homologs, and and this I, I mentioned this earlier. This this came up with a question here. This idea of like what, how much of our DNA is homologous with a banana, and and I think that the, what was posted was forty percent. That's probably accurate. It's probably something like that. Uh, and so we, we would call those sections that are the same homologous. They are the same genes that do the same things. They may not be exactly identical letter for letter, but they do the same things. We can do that. We can genotype, uh, sequence the genome for a, a huge number of species now. There's a, a, a technique called shotgun sequencing, which is just a, uh, a way of using a computer basically to greatly increase the speed that you can sequence a genome. So we do that uh, often, 
and we can compare the genomes of many different species. Oh, there's a question here. Would people who have two different colored eyes have two dominant eye color genes? Or one of them still be receptive? Now that's an excellent question. Heterochromia. When you have two different colored eyes, I have no idea what the genetic mechanism is for that. And I don't think that the mechanism is always genetic. Sometimes there's a physiological environmental mechanism um, involved for for that. I think chimeraism is part of the part of the explanation. This I have to check out. Chimerism is when you have areas within your body that actually have different DNA. Um, and you, you may have seen this before. This is we're departing a little bit from what we're talking about here, but that's okay. Um, you may have seen like a cat that has like a very um, you know what? Why don't I just show you? This is this is much easier. To, I can just pull up a picture of this. Oops, Daisy. That's not what I want. No, I'm not looking for a mythical chimera. I'm looking for a genetic chimera. There we go. So you might see a cat like this. This is a perfect example of a chimera cat. So if you actually took a DNA sample from both sides of this cat, you would find that they are actually not the same DNA. <laughs> so they have areas in their body that are actually different DNA. And this, this sometimes happens when two different fertilized eggs fuse together during, um, during the, the growth process. So this is in, in the womb. And, this, and, this, and, and I shouldn't say it's not exclusive to wombs. Like this can happen in, or, in many different types of organisms where you have this fusion of two fertilized eggs. Um, and then so, so you actually end up with two genetically different organisms that are becoming one organism. This is fairly common in the animal world. I don't think this is very common in humans. It definitely happens in humans. But this is, I don't think this is the primary mechanism for heterochromia in humans. In, in, and it is an excellent question. I mean, they have a picture of a human here, but I don't. I don't think that is actually. It, it's similar to twin absorption. Um, in it, 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 twin absorption usually happens later in in the process. Um, th this is before there's anything structural uh, present. It's very very early um, in the uh, zygote development. Um, but it is similar to twin absorption. And twin absorption also um, results in areas with different DNA within the organism. Because uh, we're not talking about identical twins. We're talking about um, fraternal twins that are uh, being absorbed. You can have identical twin absorption as well, uh, in which case um, then there is no different section of DNA because they are genetically identical to each other. But um, oh, this is one mechanism for humans for heterochromia. Um, Here, here's a great uh, visual of it here, which is essentially that there are areas within the body uh, that contain the fertilized egg from one embryo and the fertilized egg from another. Um, I don't know what the other mechanism is. There's an environmental mechanism that causes um, heterochromia in humans, and so I, I, I have to, I'd have to investigate this more. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Michael. I don't have a full answer to your question. Uh, chim chimeraism is is part of the explanation. Great, I'll check you off, Derek. Uh, oh, hopefully, hopefully that answered your question. That, that's as far as I know. Uh, th there is an environmental uh, pathway as well for that. Um, where was I here? Oh yeah, homologs. Okay, so uh, if you take the DNA of a bunch of different species and you compare which areas are the same, basically, which are homologous to each other, you start to build up a map of relatedness because the more you share in DNA with another organism, the more closely related you are to it. And that's actually true even within humans. Uh, the more DNA you share with another human, the closer you relate to that human as a human. Uh, you have more DNA in common with your parents than you do with any other human. I mean, unless you have an identical twin. Um, and, that, and that's because you are a combination of your parents' genetics. And so if we 
and so that, then we'd be getting into even specific code, not just homologs, but even specific gene, uh, alleles, specific versions of specific genes. But for example, if you were to look at um, human, the human DNA code, okay? And so I'm gonna call this 100%, this is human. Okay, you are, if you compared your code to any other human, you are 100% homologous to every other human. That's the percentage, that's the same, okay? Uh, there are differences, like I said, within the code, uh, small differences, but they're all still homologs. In other words, you are genetically compatible to mate with every other human. Uh, then if you look at, for example, chimpanzees, if you look at their amount of homolog, it would be something like, oof, I don't know, I'd have to look up the number. It's like 98% or 99%, it's very high, okay? So the percentage that's the same is very high. Uh, if you were to look at other primates, the, the amount that's the same with other primates, and again, I, I, I don't have exact values for you. I can look them up, but I'm not going to. It just takes too long, but I mean, we're 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 somewhere in the high 90s. So let's let's say it's like 96 percent or something like that. The same between all primates, and then if you were to even look between you and all mammals, so you and your dog or you and your cat or whatever, um, we're still talking about an extremely high percentage that's similar. If you look at the body systems and biochemistry, I mean, it's it, it's very very similar. I mean, it might be. It might be 95% or 94%. And this is just like other mammals. But you, and so, so these are the most closely related groups to you, simply based on homologs. We can, we can figure this out. And, but you can keep going. You can, as somebody mentioned earlier, you can, you can throw out the banana and say, okay, well, what about a banana? Well, banana might be 40% homo homologous here. And then you can go back and look at a bacteria, okay? But bacteria even have a significant amount of homol uh, homology. So you, you might go to bacteria and you find it's like 20% homologous. It would, it would be species dependent, of course, but... Um, and so you can do this comparison and go along and look at level of relatedness to various organisms. And from that, you can actually build a tree of relatedness. Uh, so that tree of relatedness, and by the way, this process has been going on for a long time. So when, when, we're, when we're talking about being related to a bacteria, uh, we're not talking about a recent common ancestor. We're talking about a, a, an ancestor from a long time ago. Uh, when we're talking about the history of life, we're talking about a, a process of about 3.8 billion years. It's a little bit difficult to um, to really visualize how long 3.8 billion years is, but it's extremely long. So I, th I think people tend to underestimate how long 3.8 billion years actually is, uh, especially people that are very skeptical of the evolutionary process. Um, they, they don't tend to really understand how long 3.8 billion years is. It's an extremely long time. And, and if you were to look at that as a, as a timeline, you know, like an extremely long timeline, okay, you like lay it all out. And then you were to look at the entire, the entire human existence. We used to do this as a lab. We used to do this on a piece of paper so you could actually see it in the fossil record where humans began. I'm gonna use a shorthand here for a billion years. You, you're not, on this line that I've drawn here, you're like not even a pixel. <laughs> so like the entire history of humanity is just like, I don't, I'm not even sure on this time scale if it would even be visible. It's like, it's just a little hint at the end. Uh, I, it probably wouldn't be visible in this time scale. So, um, we, we used to do this with um, like ticker tape, if you've ever used ticker tape in physics, or, or like a receipt tape, and we'd roll it out and it would go all the way down the hall from the uh, King Street parking lot all the way down to the uh, stairs that go down to Phys Ed. It's a long, long thing. And it, 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 where humans are is like the last centimeter 
quarter of a centimeter <laughs> at the end of the tape. So, I mean, it's like our, our entire history as a species, not, not even talking about recorded history, but our, our history as a species existing is just, just a tiny, tiny fraction of the entire history of life on Earth. So we're, we are talking about an absolutely massive um, time scale here. That's important to remember because the process of evolution does take a very long time. Um, but anyway, um, you, you, we see speciation events occurring from the origin of life all the way up until now. And so if you were to lay the actual tree of life along here, uh, you would, it obviously begins with a single organism at the beginning. Uh, and that, that organism is known as the origin. We know a little bit about the origin. We don't have a fossil record for it. It's a single cell, um, or even even anywhere near this old, because single-celled organisms don't leave good fossils. So um, a, a lot of the um, the idea of what the origin was is just based on what we know about the early Earth and what materials can form spontaneously in the environment of the early Earth. And so a lot of experimentation has been done to find out, okay, if you have these chemicals in this temperature, you know, in this pressure, what can form? What can form? And it's, it's actually really amazing what can form. Lots of things. Uh, simple RNA sequences can form. Uh, plasma membranes, which are cell membranes, can form spontaneously from the chemicals uh, that are found in the early Earth. So um, I, we don't get into this too much in this course, but if you're interested in this, there's a whole area of science that, is, uh, that investigates this. Um, but anyway, we, we don't have direct evidence for the origin, obviously, too long ago. Uh, our direct evidence is actually quite a bit more recent um, because it's mostly fossil record evidence, but, but we, we can make good guesses about stuff early on. And so what we see based on homologs, uh, by the way, uh, we can also figure out how long ago roughly the splits occur in the tree. So when we're talking about an origin, an original species, and then a speciation event happening, okay, a speciation event is when one species becomes two. We talk about this more in the evolution unit, so I'm not going to go into great detail here. And then over time, there's another speciation event and some of these subspecies become their own species. They, they split off. Some of them go extinct, some of them don't. Uh, but you can, you can start drawing a tree from the origin all the way up. And of course, these, these trees get more and more complex as, as life evolves on Earth. And you can, you can keep drawing the tree up and up and up and up and up. Uh, until the present day, when you get all the way up until now. And we, we have some pretty good tools to actually figure out where some of these splits have occurred on the tree. And how we do that is we look at the number of differences in base pairs between related things. When we're talking about single differences, single base pair switches, single letters in the code, uh, there is a natural background rate that DNA mutates at. If you just let a species exist in nature and reproduce, over time, it will get changes happening to the DNA. Random mistakes, they're called mutations, and we'll talk about them more in detail later. Um, but there is a background rate at which those mutations happen. So we can, to some extent, track backwards based on that rate of change and get a general sense for when these splits have occurred. Now, once we get back way f back far here into like the first billion years of life, I, there's some guesswork happening here. I'm not going to pretend that we're we've got real nailed down dates for this. But but later on, when we start looking at the fossil record, uh, once we're seeing multicellular organisms in a fossil record, um, we actually have much much better uh, dates that we can associate with when these speciation events occurred. Some of them are visible in the fossil record, and we can tell by the level of strata where it is in the Earth's crust, approximately how long ago it occurred. Uh, and then we can also use this genetic evidence to determine how long ago the splits occurred. So we, we actually have pretty good tools here uh, to figure out where the splits are. Uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do more on the evidence for evolution later on in a different unit, but the, the general idea here is that if you trace back all living things, you can trace them all back together. They run together at some point 
to a common species. So you have a common ancestor with a chimp at some point in history. And I think on another page here, I have more specific numbers on these uh, or with other, the other primates or other animals or whatever. You can go back as far as you like, bacteria. Hard to imagine. It's important to note that when people say things like, we're all descended from monkeys, that that is not a true statement because the current monkeys or chimps, or I mean, there there's a, many different species of monkey, but and chimps are not monkeys, by the way, they're a different species. But um, what we're really saying is that those chimps or monkeys or gorillas or whatever you want to refer to, primates, uh, they had an ancestor that was the same ancestor as our ancestor, but it wasn't a monkey. Monkeys are the current iteration of that species. Um, so our ancestor that we share with them wasn't was was no more a monkey than it was a human. It was a different species, a precursor species that was neither of those things. So we didn't evolve from monkeys. We evolved from a common ancestor that we shared with monkeys. So that's 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 just something important to know. And quite a long time ago, by the way, uh, primate ancestors where where we branched off from them is, is quite a, quite a bit of time ago. So that's the basics here is everything's related. Okay, that's what you need to know. <laughs> everything's related and we have fantastic evidence to actually show that this is true. Um, and with that, we can build this tree of life, which I already mentioned. The study of that tree and the building of that tree, the science of building that tree of life is called phylogeny. So phylogeny is, so I, I guess you could call it modern taxonomy. It is taxonomy, but based only on genetic evidence. Um, and what we try to do now is update our taxonomical system whenever we discover something new about phylogeny. So if we learn something about phylogeny that does not jive with the way that we've organized things taxonomically, we usually change the taxonomic organizational structure. Now, to, to give Carl Linnaeus a ton of credit, he actually did a really good job knowing nothing about the genetic relatedness of species. Um, our system is actually not bad. It, it really does group things relatively closely by their level of genetic relatedness. And of course, morphology is related to, how, to genetic relatedness. The things we're closest related to are the most structurally like us. So that, I mean, that obviously makes sense. But, but it's still pretty impressive that we haven't had to modify the original system too, too much. But when we do... When we look back on the original tree, and so I've got a diagram of the original tree here, um, we notice that there are three major groupings that exist, and they're shown here as B, C, and D. A, by, by the way, down here would be the origin. So that's the original cell or cells, group of cells, uh, that was formed, uh, the original life on Earth about 3.6 billion years ago. Um, there's three main branches of the tree, and that is bacteria, these are also known as the domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Those are the three main. Do, uh, bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotes. So I mentioned that earlier, this idea of prokaryotes. Prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles. They have DNA, but they don't have a nucleus. They don't have... Golgi, they don't have anything with a membrane inside, except for the cell membrane. Whereas eukaryotes, eukaryotes, or domain eukarya, all have membrane-bound organelles inside. So a nucleus, Golgi, mitochondria, etc. Okay, so these are the three main branches of life. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. I mentioned Monera at the top there only because the first two used to be combined together into one domain, but about 15 years ago, they changed it to be two. Because that's actually when we discovered the huge difference between these two groups uh, on a genetic level. So again, that, that comes with figuring out new things. So I just mentioned this again here at the bottom. You can note it again. If you're, if you're confident in your understanding of eukaryote and prokaryote, you probably don't have to write this again. But uh, eukaryote is an organism that has membrane-bound organelles. Mitochondria, Golgi, ER, vacuole, lysosomes, nucleus, etc. And pro prokaryotes just do not have that.
So, what characterizes these three main domains then? Well, bacteria are single-celled. They're all single-celled organisms. There's no multi-cell bacteria. They are all prokaryotes. They have no, uh, and they have, so they have no membrane-bound organelles. Then if you look at archaea, they're also all single-celled. They're very similar. I mean, from a structural perspective, they're virtually indistinguishable, which is why we grouped them together previously. But they're also all prokaryotes. But the, one of the interesting things about archaea is that almost all of them have unique hazardous environment strategies. So some places where you find archaea are, are anoxic environments, um, where they exist without oxygen. There are some bacteria that do that as well, but um, the archaea that are anoxic are methanogens. They produce methane as a waste product. Uh, those would be the archaea that you're most familiar with because they live in your intestines. <laughs> so you are intimately familiar with archaea that live inside of you <laughs> right now <laughs> and inside of many animals' digestive tracts. Um, there are archaea, we're going to talk about this later in more detail, so I'm not going to like super elaborate here, but there are some that live in extremely hot water above boiling. There are some that live in extremely hot, dry areas uh, like deserts, uh, sides of volcanoes. There are archaea that live in ice, which is very rare for um, single-celled organisms to grow well on ice. Um, anyway, et cetera, et cetera. So they have really cool uh, hazardous environment strategies. And then the last group, Eukarya, um, they have membrane-bound organelles, as I mentioned. Hopefully I gave people enough time to write that. It's really hard to figure that out while I'm doing a video because I have no feedback from you guys whatsoever. I think it's probably fine. Because you're typing, you probably can type faster than you can write. Okay, I'm going to assume that that's fine. If not, I do post this. In fact, uh, I will, I'll go back in a second and uh, re-upload this, but it is, um, it's available. So as I just mentioned here, um, we really favor genetic relatedness now over morphological analysis, over looking just at the physical characteristics. Uh, so if they disagree with each other at all, uh, we usually go with the ge to genetic evidence. But there's a lot of buts in biology, unfortunately. Um, <sighs> like many scientists, biologists have a real attachment to history. Uh, and so some of them are very hesitant to update systems of organization, especially in big ways, um, because they just get attached to the old way of doing things. So what I've noticed is that what tends to happen is a lot of these changes happen when old people die. <laughs> Sorry, old people. <laughs> but when older scientists uh, retire or move out of the scientific sphere, uh, a younger generation often is the one to update these systems um, to bring them more in line with genetic relatedness. Now, that's not always true. I, I, I don't want to... No, I'm sure I've offended some older scientists out there that are very flexible and forward-thinking. But uh, but I, I, I think that there is, there is a conservatism in science there that where we try and maintain systems that we've created, even if they don't necessarily function very well. But anyway... Um, that, that, that goes totally against the idea of science, which is that you always update based on best evidence. But, um, but that does happen in science sometimes. Anyway, you can take this phylogeny and, oh, did, I think I, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this. This structure that's drawn right here is called a phylogenetic tree. It is a tree based on relatedness. Okay? And you can look up some really cool phylogenetic trees, like for all of life. I, I saw a really cool one the other day. I have one saved somewhere. That, that includes like all organisms. I used to have a poster in my classroom when I worked at another school. I think I left it at another school, which is too bad. Um, that had, it was this big complex poster. It was huge and it included all 
extant species, all of the species that are currently alive. Uh, it was this huge poster. Uh, well, I don't know about every single species, but at, le at least every genus, like large groupings of species. Um, there's one just for birds. Um, I'm going to have to find probably a simpler one. Oh, this is just for bats. My goodness. This oh this is this is pretty good. Can I zoom in on this? Wait, oh it's low res. I want the high res version of that. Is this it? Nope. Bats again. I'm gonna give up on this in a second. I don't want to waste time, but Anyway, you can find complex trees like this that... Uh, I wish this was a high-res version of this because that would be really cool. But here's one that includes all of the kingdoms, which is kind of cool. Now, this does not include extinct species, so you'll notice that there's no dead ends on this tree. Um, but if you were to actually create a, a real tree uh, that was like accurate, including extinct species, there'd be a ton of dead ends as well. So this is only showing the extant species, the species that have survived to the present day. Uh, but anyway, you can trace back the tree. I like that it's a circle. It's kind of cool. When you do that, if you take that same tree, except you add in a timeline. So now over on the left-hand side here, oops, you'll notice that there's actually a timeline that indicates when the speciation events occurred. So speciation events are the circles over here that are showing when the splits are occurring in time, uh, in terms of time ago. Uh, once you do that, this is something that is called a cladogram. So a cladogram is basically a phylogenetic tree that shows time, okay? And when you look at a cladogram, um, you can use that to figure out your level of relatedness to another species. Okay, that, that, that's particularly useful for that fact. So, for example, I'll move, remove this for now, I'll put that back. If you look at our relatedness to bonobos and chimpanzees, those are our closest related, I don't know what you want to call them, cousins, closest related species. Um, there was a speciation event about six million years ago uh, where our common ancestor branched off from their common ancestor. And so when we're talking about level of relatedness, we are actually the same relatedness, same amount related to both of those groups, the bonobo and the chimpanzee, because they both have a common ancestor with us, a single common ancestor for both of them. They, they, those two groups split off from each other much later, uh, about three million years ago. So both of them are the same level of relatedness to us. Okay, And you figure out the level of relatedness by figuring out how many common ancestors ago uh, we are related to each other. If you look at the gorilla, there are two degrees of separation here between us and the gorilla. Okay, So we have a common ancestor with the chimps and then us and the chimps both have a common ancestor with the gorilla. Okay, so this is an extra level of separation from the gorilla. So we are not as closely related to the gorilla. And then if you go back even further, okay, to about 13 million years ago, now gorillas and chimps and bonobos and humans all have a common ancestor with the orangutan about 13 million years ago. Uh, and again, this is, this is based on genetic evidence and fossil record. Uh, but uh, so if you look at this, um, we are the closest related here to bonobos and chimps. Then next to them, we are closely, most closely related to gorillas. And then next to gorillas, we are the most closely related to orangutans. So you, you can use this cladogram to determine your level of relatedness to another species, how closely you are related to them compared to a different species. Okay, so that, that's one of the uses for a cladogram. It also helps um, dissect exactly when 
we shared a common ancestor with a particular species. So in a cladogram, one of the things that you need to be able to identify are groups called clades. A clade is a group that includes a common ancestor and every species that is evolved from that common ancestor. Okay, so for example, there is a clade here that includes chimpanzees. Oh, I'm gonna make that bigger, so it's easier to see. There is a clade right here that includes chimpanzees and bonobos, okay? So we have two extent, oh, why didn't that work? The heck, oh, there we go. Okay, so that, that would be considered a clade, a common ancestor and all of the extant species that come from that common ancestor. You can also find a clade that includes humans and bonobos and chimps, and that would be this right here. So this is also a clade. This clade includes the common ancestor between humans and bonobos and chimps, and all of the extant species. Extant is just the opposite of extinct, by the way. It means still surviving. Extant species that are related to that common ancestor, that came from that common ancestor. Okay, so that's a clade. That's identifying uh, a group of things that are related to a particular common ancestor. That's all that says right here. Okay, so sometimes those are uh, clades are referred to as a branch of the tree of life. Uh, but that it's, it's almost always called a clade. Okay, and as you move backwards along the branches, you you move backwards in time in a cladogram. So that that's what distinguishes it from a phylogenetic tree, because in the phylogenetic tree, there's really no time on this tree. So w you can't like look at the tree and figure out the timing of any of these when any of these events occurred uh, on a on a typical phylogenetic tree. But in a in a cladogram, timing is important. It in includes time. I just wanted to mention this because I think this is so cool. So uh, you guys have probably heard of Charles Darwin before. We'll talk about him more in the evolution unit. This is a page from Charles Darwin's journal. And this is the moment in time, at least as far as we can tell, where Darwin first sketched out a phylogenetic tree for the first time, which I think is so cool. So this is from his journals, uh, and w which, were, which were created during his voyage on the... Uh, Oh, I'm not going to forget what the name of... <sighs> what was the name of Darwin's ship? Anybody know this thing? Oh, I'm kind of bummed that I forgot that. It's kind of important um, in terms of biology history. But anyway, um, during his uh, trip around the world, basically, um, where he analyzed the morphologies of lots of different species and... Um, with this data and looking at the distribution. Is the Buster the name of the ship? Is that right? Kudos if that's correct. I, I, I actually, I... The Beagle. Thank you. It's the Beagle. Cool. Cool. It's definitely the Beagle. That sounds right. Voyage of the Beagle. Yep. Um, anyway, the first time that he ever sketched out this idea based on the geographical distribution of the species that he saw. Uh, he was like, oh, you know, it really seems like these four are related to each other somehow. And those four are also related to this other group of four. And then and he, he, kept, he sketched the first phylogenetic tree. So this is, this is when this idea first became part of like the scientific consciousness, which I think is so cool that like we have that moment in time preserved. Um, I mean... Talk about way, being way ahead of your time. This is before any genetic evidence or really fossil evidence or really anything could have been used to confirm this idea. Um, so this, this is just a conjecture at this point. It's not really in... Uh, the, now, I should say that later in his life, um, he developed a whole line of evidence that was used to um, develop this into a theory, into a, a credible scientific theory. But at this point, this is just a conjecture. But it's still really cool. Anyway... Um, Here's an example of a cladogram uh, for all of the animals. Uh, now, the, the, this, is, this one's problematic because it doesn't include dates, which is kind of annoying. Um, so I guess this is not a true cladogram. This is more of a phylogenetic tree. Um, 
It does show levels of relatedness to each other, uh, but there's no timing, which is kind of a bummer. But um, it talks about some of the major groupings of animals uh, that were shared by a particular common ancestor. Uh, and it does include level of relatedness because the things that are closest to chordates, for example, are the most closely related species because we share the most homologs. Remember that this is totally based on homologs or largely based on homologs in a fine, uh, final genetic tree. So if you look at uh, living things, it's really interesting to note that the closest to chordates, to things with a spinal cord, are actually echinoderms, which are things like starfish. Uh, we share the most homologs with them out of all of the other phylums of animals, which is kind of cool. Uh, so we're more closely related to starfish than we are to spiders, for example, which seems weird. Uh, but but based on homologs and fossil record and a whole bunch of other things, uh, this is definitely true uh, in morphology. So we, we can look at some of the things that are used to determine that. But for example, chordates have a notochord. Notochord, it means just you have a grouping of nerve that is um, found uh, centrally. Uh, it's basically the pre-makings of a spinal cord that's found during embryo embryological development. We're segmented, uh, jointed. Uh, so we have jointed appendages, um, bone structure, essentially. Um, but we are deuterostomic. Deuterostomes develop uh, their digestive tract from the anus to the mouth. So that is a specific uh, evolved trait. Uh, and we share that. Uh, we have an endoskeleton, which means that the skeleton's on the inside. Uh, and we share both of those traits with the echidnoderms, uh, which is a fairly recent, I mean, compared to these other uh, animals, uh, evolutionary development. And if we go further back here, um, this, by the way, is a the this is this is actually a, uh, an extinct animal slash protist. I don't think we know where to categorize this one exactly, but they're 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 putting it here. Um, uh, but that is an extinct species that is no longer alive, or an extinct um, phylum, I should say, of animals. Um, but if we look at the grouping on the other side over here, um, these ones uh, are also segmented, uh, but they have an exoskeleton, or they molt, or but they're all colimates. So colimates are uh, animals that have body cavities. That is, there is an external layer. In the case of uh, arthropods, it would be like their exoskeleton. Uh, in the case of us, we have a layer of fascia and skin on the outside. But you can go through that skin and fascia, and then there is a cavity inside where you find organs. Those are colimates. Pseudocolimates have, don't have clear uh, cavity inside their body. Um, so they do have a body cavity, but they, the way that it's layered inside is not as clear um, I'm not sure if you've ever uh, done a dissection. You would have done a frog last year. I don't know. You may not have had the opportunity based on what happened with the pandemic. But uh, there's a clear cavity in there. You open it up and you, there's like organs floating around in a cavity. Pseudocolomates are not layered the same way. They don't have a, very, a clear transition like that. And um, if you look on the other side here beyond the pseudocolomates, you, you find organisms that have no layering like that whatsoever. They're basically just solid tissue all the way through. Uh, so there's no obvious like, we're now we're on the outside, now we're on the inside. <laughs> In other words. Um, and so th that that is the old, those are the oldest um, animals. Uh, we, we split off from that grouping a long time ago. Uh, well, good question, actually, Ryan. Um, we believe it to be extinct because it's something that we have seen in the fossil record and there is a point in the fossil record at which it does not appear any longer or um if it's rather if it's a recent extinction event we can't find it anywhere <laughs> 
but that's not always great because uh, obviously we haven't found everything on Earth. So sometimes we say something is extinct uh, and then it actually isn't. So that, that does happen. Uh, we label something as extinct and then we find it somewhere. So that does happen. I mean, it's based on the evidence that we currently have. So if we don't see it anywhere in the fossil record, if it was around, you know, 65 million years ago and there's like a place in the fossil record, a level of strata where all of a sudden you don't see it anymore, uh, we call that extinct. Um, or if it's like a rel like I said, a relatively recent event, we just can't find it. But um, it is tricky. Yep, we make mistakes. Sometimes these things are not actually extinct, and we find them somewhere. I mean, for example, maybe there is a offshoot of this uh, protist or pseudo animal, I guess, that is lives in the deep ocean or something, and we've never seen it, and like that's where it is. Yep, could be there. That'd be cool. Then I'll, I'll uh, hopefully we can adjust this little table here. We're going to adjust this chart. Um, anyway, so this, this is an example of a phylogenetic tree. We actually compiled this tree based on morphological evidence. This is taxonomical, original morphological evidence uh, based on things like tissues and radial symmetry and things like that, as, as mentioned in it. Uh, but this is, this is backed up by uh, phylogenetic evidence, by genetic evidence. So... Um, this has remained largely the same once we add genetic evidence into the mix. When I'm, when I'm done here, um, uh, we're, we're, I'm actually just going to quickly go over what the kingdoms in a second. Um, but you, we are going to go back and complete this. Uh, th this is also listed on Brightspace. But uh, tutorial one on page 22 and 23 is a tutorial on reading cladograms. I went over the basics already what a clade is and how to read it in terms of relatedness. But this goes over it and gives you two practice problems to do, um, which you should do. It gives you the answers at the end so you can double check to see if you're right. Um, but being able to read a cladogram and look at your level of relatedness to another species is, is important. It's actually one of the essential learnings for the course. So, uh, and there's some questions on the quiz about it. So, so there's a little tutorial there on reading um, cladograms and you're gonna do that in a minute. And there are a couple analysis questions that are really just about this there uh, and uh, uh, it's mostly knowledge from from this from this lesson although there I think there is at least one question you need to do some research for there so anyway we're going to leave that to the end I'm just going to finish this next part this is this is actually quite brief um, so anyway I, I've talked a little bit about level of relatedness here this idea of the phylogenetic tree based on genetic evidence I've mentioned the three domains so I've already talked about what the three are. Uh, I want to talk a little bit now about the kingdoms. So there are six. And really, for the rest of the course after today, we're going to be spending time digging into the kingdoms. So we'll spend a whole day on bacteria, or it used to be a whole day. Now it would be, I guess, like one block, like block one or something, on bacteria and archaea. And we'll spend a block talking about fungus. And we'll spend a block talking about protists. Uh, some of these things you'll have very little experience with. Me personally, uh, before I went to university, I had never even heard of a protist. <laughs> and and I, I took this course in high school and we either skipped over it or we just ran out of time. We must have ran out of time because I learned absolutely nothing about protists in high school. And so I was, I was kind of blown away that all these, these living things existed when I, when I took my micro course in university. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, Anyway, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about what the actual diversity of life looks like. But uh, here's a, a, a phylogenetic tree on the right here of the kingdoms. Okay, They are the six main taxonomic groups underneath the domains. Um, it's important to note that they are grouped into six because of our current genetic evidence. However, some groups... Um, and I'm going, I'm going to pick protists out of the mix here specifically. Um, when you look at protists over on the right here, they actually include a whole bunch of different things that are really different from each other. Um, and when we get into protists, you'll see what I mean. You might wonder, why do we put those in the same kingdom? Like those don't even seem vaguely similar to each other. That, that's a problem. So protists are, are the worst grouping. They, they are not grouped very well, uh, not based on genetics and not based on morphology. And, and if you look up the definition for protists, 
um, it actually is defined as doesn't fit into the other kingdoms. And you'll, you'll see why. There's a bunch of weird stuff in Protoss. So, so there's an excellent chance that, that it will not be six kingdoms forever. You know, you might go to university and there might be seven or eight kingdoms. It wouldn't surprise me. So uh, just, just so you know, these are not static and they do get updated from time to time. I have a very strong feeling that Protoss are not going to be around for much longer based on genetic evidence. But we'll see what happens. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll be corrected. But the second component of this, so I am going to get you to do um, this... Uh, these questions up here in this little tutorial on cladograms. The second component of what I'm going to get you to do is complete this table. Uh, you can use the information on page 27 in your textbook on the basic characteristics of the six kingdoms. Okay, you don't need to get into too much detail here. Um, it doesn't get into that much detail on page 27, but this is just an introduction. What is kingdom U bacteria, or sometimes just called bacteria? What, what is that kingdom? Like, what are the general characteristics so I would know to put something in that kingdom? Same thing for archaea, protista, fungi, plants, and animals, okay? And then I want you to include two examples from each. Okay, when you include those examples, I want you to include the common name. Oh, why isn't this working? Is that big enough for people to see? It's a little bit small. Sorry. There we go. Common name. Come on. And scientific name. So I'm talking about specific species here, uh, not something like goats. Okay, <laughs> that is a. A grouping, but it is not one specific species. There's actually more than one goat species. Um, so I want you to pick out two species for each of these. Uh, common name and scientific name for each. You download the notes for Cami. It only let you upload to page six. Oh. Did it only have page up to page six in the first block of notes? Is that possible? Should have been there. Let, let me look on here. Did you did you upgrade to the full version of Cami using the link, Grace? Should have worked. I don't know. You might want to double check that. You, I don't think there's a page limit, so you you should be able to edit the entire file. That that is very strange. Um, you, can you do it on paper? Sure, you can do it on paper. Absolutely. I mean, I, what I really care about is that you do it, not necessarily the uh, the venue. Um, but keep in mind that for the textbook questions, so that would be where is it on here? Um, for analysis questions 25 uh, on page 25, 3, 5, 6, and 9, those you're always going to do in your um, questions portfolio, the, that, the, the doc that you're going to hand in at the end of uh, the first term. So that, that's anything like that. Uh, or even even these uh, complete practice questions one and two, you, you'd want to do that in a document that you can hand in. If you want to do it on paper, you just have to take a picture of it and insert it into that Google Doc. Um, uh, for the for the the complete the kingdom characteristics table, that's the second part. That doesn't need to go into that homework doc because that's right in the course notes. Anything in the course notes doesn't have to go in the homework doc. So that one, if you want to do it on paper, you're welcome to do it, um, but it does not have to go into your homework document. So that that's not anything that goes in the course notes doesn't go in the in the uh, homework doc. Okay, hopefully I, I was I made that clear. I'd, I'm trying. <laughs> All right. So so that's what I'm going to get you to work on. If you're if you're if you don't remember, uh, it's always summarized here um, on the on Brightspace. What what exactly you need to complete? I mentioned here that you can watch this video on phylogenetic trees. You don't have to. So this is completely optional. It does go through the procedure for making a phylogenetic tree, not just reading one. 
I don't ask you to do that. It's not in the, uh, the learning objectives for the course, so you don't have to be able to make a tree from a data table. However, if you're interested in how to make a phylogenetic tree from a table of data, um, the, the video actually goes through how to build a phylogenetic tree and read them. It talks about reading them as well. You do not have to watch this video. So this is just extra. Um, you, can, you, can re you can watch it if you wish, but you don't have to. The questions are uh, mentioned here. Um, and then when you're done all of that stuff, uh, you likely will need some time during learning block three. Um, try the practice quizzes for day one and two. They are simply for practice. So I have um, made checkpoint quizzes. I think I call them checkpoint quizzes in the other spots in the course. Those are just practice. And the purpose of the quizzes is when you're doing the the day one and two practice quiz, if there if a bunch of stuff is coming up on there that you're like, oh man, I actually don't get that. I don't know why that's the answer. That is meant to be a indicator to you to go back, look at your notes. And if you still don't get it, if you look back and you're like, I still don't get why this is the answer. That is a clear communication to you to let me know, okay? Email me, say, drop in during that period, uh, during the uh, learning block three. That's what that time is for. So I can clear that stuff up with you. If you're not doing the practice quizzes, you could be under the false assumption that you understand what's happening when you really do not understand what's happening, okay? So I strongly encourage people to try the practice quizzes. The, this, the, it, it, they, they don't count for marks. You can do them as many times as you want, but they are there to simply give you uh, an indicator as to whether or not you understood the content. And if not, maybe go back or talk to me. Uh, something quick to mention, the first two practice quizzes, I tried to embed them into Brightspace. So it actually opens them in Brightspace, which is fine, I guess. When you finish them and you submit them, it looks like it's just a blank screen, which is really annoying. But if you scroll up to the top, you there is a button at the top to check your results, but you have to scroll back up through a blank white page. Most people miss it and don't realize that you can scroll up and actually look at your results and check to see what you got right and wrong, but you can, okay? You just have to scroll up to the top and hit the button that says check results. If you don't scroll up, you won't find the button. Later on, I have the quizzes open up in another a separate window and then you don't have that problem anymore. So I probably should just fix that, but, um, but anyway, they still work. They work perfectly fine. If you haven't completed the student parent information survey, please do that. I need that data this weekend. I'm gonna compile a list uh, of parent emails specifically, and I would like to look over your personal information as well, to get to know you a little bit. Some of you guys already know, but, um, and you can add anything new to your diversity vocabulary list. I highly recommend adding it as you go, as opposed to putting it in at the end. Uh, putting it at the end doesn't tend to work very well for students. If you have any questions at all, I'm gonna be in that Google Meet at one. You can also post them in the chat at any time. The practice quizzes column are, for the first two practice quizzes, are actually up in the sidebar over here. So underneath day two right here, you'll see that it says practice checkpoint quiz one for day one and two content. And then there's another practice checkpoint quiz two for day three and four content at the end of day four. So that's where they are in the first unit. After the first unit, I actually embed them right into the like numbered steps. I say like, try the practice quiz with a link. I just, I just put them right in here because that's easier for kids, I think, to find, for students to find, I should say. That's correct. You need 30 vocabulary total for the entire unit, not 30 a day, 30 for the entire unit. It seems like a big number, but you will 100% get 30 in your terms. I mean, it's, I, I can't, I'm just guessing, but you probably found 10 today. So I, I, I don't I don't think it'll be tough to find 30 terms for this for this unit at no problem. Okay, if you guys need anything at all, I will be here the entire time. Uh, just type in the chat. You can email me if you need to, but it, chat is preferred. And uh, if you're interested in visiting me, I will see you at one o'clock in the Google Meet. Other than that, guys, you have yourselves a great weekend you made it it's friday right <laughs> yeah it's friday have a great weekend uh hopefully the first two days of biology were at least a little bit inter interesting uh and more to come